Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third event in our 2022-2023 virtual scholarly seminar series titled Surviving the Long Wars. My name is Rona K. Kapadia. I'm an associate professor of gender and women's studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago and one of the co-organizers of this series, along with my museum and exhibition studies colleagues, Therese Quinn and Aaron Hughes. By way of a visual description, I'm a late 30 something brown person with clear glasses and a beard and a color block shirt in my home office on the northwest side of our city. We're going to get started in just a few moments, but first an access invitation. We invite you to get comfortable in your space. Live captioning is available for this webinar. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, you can click on CC live transcript and then show subtitles. You can also access the captions in a separate stream text web browser window, which will drop periodically in the chat. Um, we've just dropped it now. And after my opening remarks, the chat is going to be turned off for attendees during the webinar as an access consideration for those of us using screen readers. But we invite you to post comments and questions toward the end of today's conversation in the Q&A feature, which we will address as time permits. Although our focus today is on a moderated discussion with our speaker, Professor Lale Khalili, led by one of our NEH veteran fellows, Natasha Erskine. If there are any other access needs, please post them in the Q&A and our team will do our best to meet them in real time. Please note, as you saw, that we are recording today's webinar and a digital archive of all of our seminar events will be made available on our website at a later date. Survivingthelongwars.online is our website. Please bookmark it and please join our mailing list. Um, this is where you can join our mailing list, as I've just said, to learn about future events in the series, as well as the 2023 Veteran Art Triennial and Summit opening next spring in Chicago. That's my cue to inform you to stay tuned for future events in our scholarly series in the winter and spring 2023 semester, including a talk by Harsha Walia, the long-term movement organizer and author of Border and Rule and Undoing Border Imperialism, who will be with us on Thursday, January 26th. We're going to drop that Eventbrite information for that talk in the chat now as well. So to start off today's events, while we are in virtual space together, we do want to acknowledge and honor the original peoples of the Chicagoland area where the University of Illinois Chicago is based, the Three Fires Confederacy, the Potawatomi, Odawa, and Ojibwe nations, as well as other tribal nations that know this area as their ancestral homelands, including the Menomee, Ho-Chunk, Miami, Peoria, and Sac and Fox, as well as their descendants. Further, we acknowledge this land is the current home to one of the largest urban Native American communities in the United States. Native people are part of Chicago's past, present, and future. And finally, we are reminded that a land acknowledgement, especially by non-Native diasporic settler people of color like myself, should not just be a rhetorical gesture, but instead the animating force and material ground from which any critique of violence, imperialism, militarism, and war that we forward here today is made possible. To acknowledge is to act, and we encourage everyone to consider the multitude of ways to translate knowledge and thoughts into active support for Indigenous peoples and communities locally, nationally, and around the world. So by way of introduction, we are a collective of scholars, curators, and artists at UIC working at the nexus of critical ethnic studies, feminist and queer studies, contemporary art and museum and exhibition studies. We've been collaborating for over a year on a national endowment for the humanities funded project. Surviving the Long Wars explores the multiple overlapping histories that shape our understanding of warfare, as well as the alternative visions of peace, healing and justice generated by diverse communities impacted by war. Our project attempts to visualize the parallels and intimacies between the two longest military conflicts in US history, the American Indian Wars of the 18th and 19th centuries, and the 21st century global war on terror from the vantage point of contemporary Black, Indigenous, and people of color, or BIPOC veteran artists, as well as those most impacted by these wars. Today's talk by Professor Lale Khalili is the third in a virtual scholarly seminar series on new directions in comparative ethnic and native and indigenous studies on the histories and futures of native rebellion alongside contemporary US militarisms and war. And I must say, I'm so delighted that Professor Khalili accepted our invitation to join us today. Time in the Shadows is perhaps one of my all time favorite scholarly books and I could not be more excited to be in dialogue with you tonight. 
Our next talks, as I've already mentioned, are scheduled for next semester with Harsha Walia, Nick Estes, Kelly Hayes, and Tiffany Latavo King, respectively. The seminar series is part of a year-long UIC graduate class and NEH Dialogues on the Experiences of War discussion program taught by veteran artist Aaron Hughes, which is exploring the legacies of US settler colonial military conflicts through the artistic practices and experiences of BIPOC veterans and those communities most impacted by these war regimes, including native and indigenous descendants and South and Southwest Asian and Muslim diaspora communities. Our entire project culminates in the second veteran art triennial and summit in spring 2023 at the Chicago Cultural Center, the Hyde Park Art Center, and the Newberry Library. Throughout, we hope to spotlight new scholarship, forge innovative community collaborations, diminish silos in our interdisciplinary fields, and most importantly, highlight the role of art and culture in the historic and ongoing movement against militarization, war, and empire. Now for my thank yous, Surviving the Long Wars is organized by Aaron Hughes, myself, Therese Quinn, Joseph Lefthand, Anthony Torres, and Amber Sora, with support from the University of Illinois at Chicago, the UIC Institute for the Humanities Innovation Grant, the UIC Award for Creative Activity, the Chicago Cultural Center, the Hyde Park Art Center, the Newberry Library, the D. Mill Art Fund, and the National Endowment for the Humanities Dialogues on the Experiences of War Grants. Special thanks to Margaret Fink of the UIC Disability Cultural Center, Tal Foster of the Native American Support Program, and Zainab Hilal and Rachel Dukes, our amazing graduate coordinators at UIC on this project, as well as our captioner today, Lindsay Shirley. It's now my pleasure to briefly introduce our moderator and NEH veteran fellow, Natasha Erskine, who, I'll be who will also be introducing our esteemed speaker, Lale Khalili, today. N Natasha, if you'll join me on camera now, um, we're also going to drop these bios into the chat feature as well. So Natasha Erskine is a native of the South Side of Chicago, born and raised in Inglewood. She currently serves as the organizing director of About Face Veterans Against the War. Natasha is a U.S. Air Force combat veteran retiring in 2016 after 20 years on active duty. She became fully disillusioned with participating in post 9-11 wars while assigned to Headquarters Special Operations Command. Natasha began organizing in grassroots communities while on active duty, advocating for vital resources to directly impacted peoples and communities. Natasha brings a wealth of strategic organizing, relationship, community building, and project management experience. Her passion is to build power with the people to reclaim resources from the military industrial complex. As a community servant, Natasha is deeply involved with a myriad of projects rooted in racial and social justice, mass liberation, veteran healing, educational equity, drawing on connections between her military experiences and the militarization of the state and neighborhoods in the United States. Natasha speaks in local public schools with youth, with teachers, with community, with JROTC pro military programs, advocating for more career training opportunities and culturally relevant courses in high schools. Natasha, welcome. It's my pleasure to join, have you join us and please take it away. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It is so good to be in community with you. I am Natasha. I am a Black woman um, in my early 40s um, in my home office um, here on the far side of south side of Chicago. I am wearing Black and also rimless glasses. Um, I have a locked hairstyle with one side um, tapered or shaven. Um, I am in a jean jacket with a yellow shirt um, and a necklace um, joining you today. Again, I am so happy to be in community with you all who are you know, joining us virtually. And I know that we are in for a really great conversation. So, you know, I really want to, you know, keep my introduction um, more brief, but one of the things that makes me so excited, um, you know, to moderate this discussion, um, as Rona mentioned, is my own experience in special operations. And what I've learned from that is that it's a very small few and percentage of, of, you know, veterans who, you know, maybe have been in the, in that, in that realm. Um, the special ops realm and, and or um, just have um, you know a lot of curiosity around um, the polarization of, of special operations um, and, and today's conversation around Navy Navy SEALs specifically. So you know 
as I mentioned, just really excited to, to learn more, to hear from you, to have a dialogue and, and really get into the connections that I've drawn from my experience, particularly around the you know, defense, um, Department of Defense's use of the 1033 program and how even the special operatives, uh, you know, machinery, weaponry, um, you know, all of their contingent of, um, you know, supplies and, and things that, you know, make them feel exceptional is now, you know, given to police departments to police our communities. Um, and so I am very clear about the connection between um, the military, whereby we're talking about special operations, equipment, and gear um, being used um, in communities um, that is here on our own um, homeland. So um, really want to get into more discussion around that in our Q&A after your talk. Um, and so now I really want to um, take the time to welcome our um, esteemed um, guests. And so today I am with um, Dr. Lili Kalali who is a professor of international politics at Queen Mary University of London and the author of Heroes and Martyrs of Palestine, The Politics of National Commemoration, Cambridge of 2007, Time in the Shadows, Confinement and Counterinsurgencies, and Asinus of War and Trade, Shipping and Capitalism in the Arabian Peninsula. Her talk today is titled Tomahawks, Chinooks, Geronimo, a Settler Colonial Fantasies of U.S. Navy SEALs. Welcome, Dr. Kalele. Um, thank you very much, Natasha, for your generous um, invitation. And it's a real pleasure to meet you. I'm incredibly grateful to be asked to give this talk by Ronak and um, I'm very proud to be presenting um, to all of you. Um, as uh, Natasha mentioned, my name is Lale Khalili, and I am a, a woman uh, of Iranian origin, have dark hair, um, and I uh, my hair is up. Uh, I'm sitting in my uh, living room uh, with the books behind me. Um, I'm wearing red lipstick, and I will occasionally wear my red reading glasses. Um, so uh, with thanks again, I would like to start my talk and I'll be very happy to answer any questions about it at any point. Okay, so after the final shot was emptied in Osama bin Laden's forehead, Admiral McRaven, who was in Jalalabad, Afghanistan, and who was receiving news from the operation, in turn reported to the Situation Room in the White House, where the National Security Council awaited. Geronimo. EKIA. EKIA means enemy killed in action. 20 minutes earlier, two Chinook and two Black Hawk helicopters had carried US Navy SEALs, a backup team, and extra fuel for midair refueling from Jalalabad in Afghanistan across the border to Abbottabad in Pakistan, where Ben Laden was hiding. US military helicopters, the aerial vehicle most often used in unconventional or covert operations, are named after indigenous Turtle Island nations. In addition to Black Hawk and Chinook, helicopters can be Apache, Lakota, Comanche, or Kiowa. A U.S. Army Aviation Museum curator in Alabama has said that the Native, and I quote him, the Native Americans were probably the most lethal and unconventional force that we fought, given their resources and what their capabilities were, end quote. The naming of these lethal vehicles by them is meant to be a sign of respect. Again, this is not me, this is them. The US military also uses gray eagle predator drones named after an indigenous elder and deploys low altitude missiles called tomahawks. US Navy, SEAL, uh, uh, US Navy SEALs themselves pride themselves in carrying alongside their specialized assault weapons that Natasha mentioned, a tomahawk hatchet, of, uh, which is crafted by an artisan who made the blades for the film The Last of the Mohicans. A member of SEAL Team 6 told the New York Times that the hatchets are used for, and I quote, breaching, getting into doors, manipulating small locks, hand-to-hand -hand combat, and other things, end quote. The logo of the Red Squadron of SEAL Team 6 is the word tribe written under the profile image of an indigenous American and two cross tomahawks on a red background. 
So there is quite a lot of symbols of indigenous Turtle Islanders um, that are embedded in um, Navy SEAL mythology. In this talk, I will discuss the US Navy SEALs appropriation of indigenous symbols, but also other forms of self and other mythologizing that is crucial to the reproduction of their legitimacy in the global long war. Sometime around 2006, a major shift in the way um, in which the US chooses to project its military power in the Middle East and Central Asia occurred. By then, the abject failure of US military activity based on a com combination of conventional warfare and a special operations fighting, especially in Iraq, had become apparent. The shift, most vociferously and effectively promoted by General David Petraeus and his counterinsurgent colleagues, entailed a massive increase in the number of troops, a doubling or tripling of detentions in Iraq, and a broad range of other activities, including building walls to separate and encircle neighborhoods and cities, sweeps of populations, and a series of quote unquote developmental projects, including building roads, clinics, and schools. And these projects, all of these, were meant to persuade the population to come over to the side of the counterinsurgents. We know how this story ends. The US withdrew its forces from Iraq in 2011 um, and moved its counterinsurgency practices and practitioners to Afghanistan, where they were also withdrawn drawn down 10 years later. What became ascendant in the wake of counterinsurgency in Iraq was a triumvirate of military practices that do not require the same level of troops or the same budgetary expenditures and are far less visible and subject to monitoring that counterinsurgency by virtue of its gargantuan personnel and machinery had been. The use of remote aerial vehicles or drones for surveillance and assassination, number one more extensive and exclusive focus on training proxy forces like the police and military personnel of a local client or ally, number two. And finally, a massive ramping up in the use of soldiers in the special operations command, number three. All of these practices had already been in use in both Iraq and Afghanistan. However, with Obama coming to power, they became the predominant modes of projection of military power. And given the continuing constraints on US spending, the lighter footprint, quote unquote, they represent, is central to continued US presence worldwide. As one CNAS, CNAS is a uh, centrist um, uh, security think tank in, the, in Washington DC. As one CNAS report indicates, these um, uh, practices are also useful because, and I quote, by being as minimalist and non-intrusive as possible, the light footprint aims to reduce the partner nation's dependency on US resources and minimize the chances of a backlash from the local population, end quote. Further, in opposition to massive and expansive troop surges, which put enormous pressure on the militaries, the light footprint approach better fits the long war paradigm. The same CNAS report says, and I quote again, the messy struggle to stabilize foreign governments or at attack shadowy terrorist networks is inherently a long-term institutional endeavor, endeavor based on bolstering or eroding the legitimacy of armed political actors. A light footprint strategy is patient. It assumes a long timeline and slow progress instead of attempting to surge resources for rapid results, end quote. Crucial to this light footprint strategy, whether for specific operations or for the training of local and proxy security forces or special operations forces. What I want to talk about today are the Navy, US Navy SEALs, who are the special operations arm of the US Navy, but who for joint operations in which they cooperate with other U US military branches and or the CIA, they operate under the command of the highly classified Joint Special Operations Command or JSOC. JSOC is a fascinating arm of the US military because unlike the other branches, the Army or Navy or Air Force or the Marines, it does not report through the usual chain of command to the Joint Chiefs of Staff and its budget is not included in the regular Pentagon budget. Instead, it is a highly classified body that reports directly to the White House and its budget is classified on a separate line item than the regular Pentagon budget. This humdrum discussion of budgeting matters when it comes to the Spartan pretensions of the US Navy SEALs, about which I will be speaking a bit later. The US Navy SEALs have become the center of much attention since May 2011, when the aforementioned operation to assassinate Osama bin Laden, codenamed Geronimo, took place. 
The operation has become central to a number of pop culture products, film Zero Dark Thirty and Act of Valor, in which cellular seals are played by the real ones. Uh, the memoir by one participant in the operation, Matt Bissonnette, titled No Easy Day, and a series of reportage on the events by Peter Bergen, which is called Manhunt, and Mark Bowden's The Finish. And not least because the Obama administration, in search of security credibility, provided a great deal of open access to the makers of the film and authors of the book, to the SEALs. Every war the United States has fought in the last 50 years has produced a vast corpus of memoirs and oral histories written by soldiers of all ranks, generals to privates, who have to varying degrees examined through the prism of violence, everything from the quotidian conduct of war to larger existential questions about the seemingly intractable universality of war. Some of these memoirs have been published as trade paperbacks. The oral histories have been collected shortly thereafter or sometimes decades subsequently, either by independent historians or by the military's own histori historiography unit, which uses these oral histories as the basis of lessons learned. The memoirs and oral histories arising from the US war in Vietnam are the most numerous, and those coming out of the thus far two decade long war on terror seem to be fast catching up. Already in 2007, so um, about 14 years ago, 15 years ago, Keith Brown and Catherine Lutz were writing about an entire genre of quote unquote grunt lit as the work of these unwitting quote unquote participant observers of empire. What makes the US Navy SEALs particularly interesting and distinct from this grunt lit is that in addition to the memoirs they have authored or co-authored with their ghostwriters, they're also prolific producers of self-help manuals, usually found in business and management sections of trade bookstores. And they're also frequent objects of lust in romance novels produced primarily online via self-publishing. What I want to talk about here today are these three genres of writing because I argue these genres of writing are not examples of subaltern soldier voices. They are not grantlet, but rather as instruments in the production of a series of hegemonic tropes, some having to do specifically with militaries and militarism in American cultural production, and some having to do with broader themes, manhood, Americanness, and the myth of meritocracy. All of them are centrally pre predicated on a culture of settler colonial conquest that goes back all the way to the dispossession expropriation, and mass murder of indigenous Turtle Islanders. So, on to memoirs. In their examination of war memoirs of soldiers and subalterns, Brown and Lutz tell us that the texts they examined were, and I quote, undisciplined, disruptive, subversive, and scandalous. They describe exploded bodies, use racist epithets to describe the Iraqi people, often with ambiguous, ironic, or no critical framing, and both celebrate and mock superior officers and office official versions of the truth about the war, end quote. Perhaps because of the specialized nature of SEAL service and the aura of myth surrounding special operators, whether they're SEALs, Rangers, or Delta Force, SEAL memoirs are very different. They aim at a narrower range of effects and affects, as will become clear below, and all have very similar narrative arts, um, arcs and ethics. As a New York Times report on the popularity of these war memoirs explains, now there's a whole generation of readers who are growing up with the military, a publisher of such memoirs said, and particularly the SEALs are larger than life heroes. Sarah, this is the New York Times report. Sarah Brown, a buyer at Changing Hand Bookstore in Tempe, Arizona, said these books were attractive to readers who wanted to read about the wars with a positive spin. You have admiration for these elite soldiers and they're doing heroic things and you don't have to wade into the politics of anything, she said. People feel they're reading about the war, but it's not as hard to swallow. How many books can you read about how we shouldn't be there or how we got there or the history of Taliban? So this is the end of the New York Times uh, section. In a sense, then, these memoirs are significant because they're popular, have a specific spin, and as such represent a kind of common sense. The SEAL memoirs I study, I study follow a particular narrative arc. They will often begin with a personal scene setting, a succession of beautiful women loved and lost, close families, abusive fathers, and the like, before they move on to the actual process of joining the Navy SEALs. Dedicate a significant portion of the story to, uh, story to Bud's basic underwater uh, demolition SEAL training. And if the memoirs are about the specialized SEAL Team 6 or Dev Grew, or whatever classified names it's being called now, training that follows buds. 
In most of these memoirs, a series of subsequent operations are recounted, but in some ways, most of these operations, although they're intended to be the narrative heart of the book, tend to pale in comparison with the intensity and colorfulness of the BUDS training, no matter how familiar, repetitive, and predictable the latter can become. I will have something to say about this in a moment. Politically, the memoirs fall, into the right of the, fall to the right of the spectrum, with one or two exceptions. One SEAL who was involved in U.S. Operation Restore Hope in Somalia, for example, argues that the Clinton administration essentially turned tail in Somalia and should have stayed and, quote unquote, finished the job. Another, a best-selling author of a massively failed uh, of a book about a massively failed operation in Afghanistan in 2005, complains about the restrictive rules of engagement, laws of war, and possible repercussions of killing civilians who may have inadvertently stumbled upon CL special operations. Another, recounting the U.S. military presence in Beirut in 1982, rehashes the civil war in Lebanon as an inscrutable cauldron of ethnic hatreds. As Richard Drennan has written in his incandescent Indian hating and empire building, the exact measure of Anglo-American racial arrogance has been, quote unquote, our arrogation of the right to decide whether they should be humored in their lives or have it wiped out. Drennan also mentions that somehow the mythology that, is, that has emerged out of the wholesale murder of so many different indigenous turtle islanders has created an arrogance about the um, uh, indefeatability of U.S. forces overseas. Of course, this kind of wiping them uh, away because they are not um, civilized enough um, is... Uh, of course, has applied to the Aboriginal inhabitants of the Americas, but also to the imperial subjects that are made targets of military equipment, named after the people themselves that have been subjugated by the progenitors of the same military. The seal, the SEAL memoirs are, as a general uh, rule, atrocious in their treatment of women, scandalous in discussions of race and ethnicity, with specific exceptions made towards ethnic brethren in the SEALs, and irreverent towards politicians. But they are significant books, and as many, as many become major bestsellers. All these memoirs reproduce a series of familiar tropes about manhood and hardness, produced not only through narratives of endless and grueling military training, but also through a thorough and fascinating and universal fascination with kinetic toys. They tend to be anti-authority, but in that conformist U.S. style, which manages to reconcile such libertarian rhetorical flourishes with a deep respect for God, flag, capitalism, country, and certain entrenched gender and sexuality norms. Faith tends to reverberate through all seal memoirs, and various prayers, even the text of the Muslim Adhan, are quoted with ease in these memoirs. Interestingly, at least among the authors of Navy SEAL memoirs, the vast majority of the SEAL seem to be Catholic, and all of the authors of these memoirs are all white. Even the exceptional memoir of a transgender SEAL repeats many of the same tropes uh, around gender and race, though its politics are more middle of the ground. Uh, than outright right wing. The biggest difference between Kristen Beck, the warrior princess, and the other SEAL memoirs is the de uh, degree of uncertainty she demonstrates about some of the operations she participated in. But it is illustrative that Beck has politics firmly ensconced within the bounds of national security milieu and has, for example, shown no sympathy or solidarity for Chelsea Manning's regular, inhumane, uh, regularly, uh, regular and inhumane imprisonment and detention. An intense sense of camaraderie is another strong theme of the memoirs. It is not surprising that military training is intensely focused on producing in-group loyalty of the kind that allows people to die for their comrades, or that this sense of loyalty is so strong that it, it rather than abstract ideas about freedom or patriotism, is often what primarily motivates soldiers to fight and kill. That's why they often use the, discussion, the, the language of tribes or clans to describe themselves without any sense of irony uh, that, that the emergence of them as a group, as, as a quote unquote tribe and clan is predicated on a kind of modernity that actually um, wiped out real tribes, nations and clans of indigenous um, turtle islanders. 
The second category of books, so that was the memoirs. The second category of books includes business self-help manuals written by former SEALs and other special operators who transformed their military training into guidelines for successful business management. These books are fascinating in, in how they conjugate managerial speak with military speak, and also because of their open discussion of failures of military operations, which memoirs usually don't. At any given time, there are only about 2,000 Navy SEALs amidst the force of up to one and a half million active service personnel and nearly 900,000 res reserve forces. So that's one and a half million active uh, service personnel, nearly a million reserve forces, and only 2,000 Navy SEALs. It is fascinating then that this elite sliver of the US military has parlayed their experience of elite fighting and military connections into very successful, often military related businesses. The best example of this, of course, is Eric Prince, who upon retirement from the SEAL set up Blackwater as a private advanced training facility, taking advantage of the great privatization drive in the US military at the end of the 1990s. After selling Blackwater, Prince, who has moved to the UAE to avoid prosecution for Blackwater overcharging the Pentagon in Iraq, set up another firm with a number of other U.S. Uh, Navy SEALs named Frontier Services Group, which provides private security service for Chinese firms investing in Africa. Although Frontier is the name given in banking to investment in low-income economies, one wonders about that as well, it is no surprise that an ex-Navy SEAL would nod at the settler colonial conquest in his company name. What these business self-help books do is to enshrine the myth of meritocracy, so central to the hegemonic ideal of the American dream, through their stories of Bada's training, and second, the ways in which the invocation of past seal exploits produce a warrior ethos which, which echo either the Indian wars, and I put the term inside square quotes, or Sparta um, in Greece, encourages militarism, high discipline, hierarchy, but also standard stories of teamwork and camaraderie and tribalness of the group, which are decidedly gendered. The most prominent theme in these business self-help books, as they are in the memoirs, is the focus on the training um, the SEALs have to uh, the SEALs have to receive, but S. Bud's training is notoriously arduous. A five-week pre-training session is followed by three phases, the first of which is an exercise and endurance. It includes such thing as being thrown into a pool with hands and ankles um, cuffed and being asked to survive for 30 minutes or running several miles on the beach while wet and sandy and at the verge of hypothermia. There's no question that the, the six month long ordeal is intended to take on only those men who are physically, but perhaps even more so psychologically strong and cool, and also to build confidence, comradeship and muscle and sense memory. It also creates a sense of superiority for which no SEAL ever apologizes. For example, Marcus Luttrell, who wrote a memoir of that failed um, operation in um, Afghanistan, writes to state, and I quote him, to state that a man is a Navy SEAL communicates about a thousand of what it really means. It would be as if General Dwight D. Eisenhower mentioned he'd once served in the army. OK, OK, we do have our own little brand of arrogance, but we paid for every last drop of that sin in sweat, blood, and brutally hard work, end quote. For all of them, adopting the pose of warriors inducted into secret societies or lodges based on arduous rituals is central to their sense of self. And in this also, they very much replicate particular notions, and, and I would say particularly stereotypical or cliched notions of how um, belonging to um, intense groups for example, uh, indigenous nations under siege works. It is no surprise that so often uh, former Navy US Navy SEALs write leadership manuals or set up leadership consulting firms for businesses. For example, Brian Heiner's first fast fearless how to lead like a Navy SEAL includes sections titles such as running to the sound of gunfire and battle rhythm. In the acknowledgments, he counts himself as old country boy from the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, whose quote unquote brand is brotherhood and battle rhythm. 
He compares business leadership to being a warrior. And he argues that a quote unquote, a warrior is a specialist within the context of a tribal or clan-based society that recognizes a separate warrior class. So they see themselves as a separate warrior class. His book is all about violence and speed. Our enemies often behead their captives, for example. He says, with a first strike mindset, people don't feel like victims, even situations in which others would consider them victims, end quote. Or we understand that then sometimes Sometimes bad things happen. We may not deserve it or it may not be fair, but we have to acknowledge it and move on, end quote. Jeff Cannon's Leadership Lessons of the U.S. Navy SEALs, um, subtitled Battle-Tested Strategies for Creating Successful Organizations and Inspiring Extraordinary Results, is written with his business exec brother and is less obviously about the clan leader to warrior to business exec beheading of en enemies, but it also follows the genre. He openly agrees that the aim is productivity and again draws comparisons between the C-suite and the battlefield, quote unquote. Our lessons were learned in the field while helping startups get off the ground. They were learned while planting limpet mines under ships. They were tested on employees who were cold, wet and hungry and vastly underpaid. They were tested in Fortune 500 corporations when the smell of fear of the axe was in the air, end quote. In all these stories, much time is spent focusing on how the SEALs are better than anyone, the way that Americans are exceptionally superior to the rest of the world. This myth of meritocracy, this myth of meritocracy and the fantasy of descent from indigenous American warriors not only distinguishes the Navy SEALs from other men of the Navy, but also creates within the Navy SEALs another set of hierarchies with the same quest structure that reminds one of the seven labors of Hercules. As one participant in the assassination of Osama bin Laden writes in his memoirs, using Aboriginal American symbols and names, and indeed in this instance, the use of Geronimo to indicate Osama bin Laden, is supposed to be, and I quote, a great honor to a great man, a great spirit. His name has come to embody the ideals of bravery and valor we ourselves wish to emulate, end quote, which makes one wonder why it is that Osama bin Laden was called Geronimo. So I don't, don't ask me, I don't know, I can't explain it. The myth of meritocracy nicely dovetails with the warrior pretensions of the Navy SEALs. All SEAL memoirs and self-help books dedicate a significant proportion of their texts to stories of past SEAL exploits, going all the way back to Vietnam, with US exploits there and in Granada, Panama, the Gulf, and Latin America most frequently celebrated. These these past exploits are invoked through detailed narratives, which while certainly fictionalized to some degree, complete with dialogues and internal thinking of the participants, establish a myth mythological lineage for the seals. The near and far ancestors the seals claim are indigenous Americans on the one hand, and the myth of Sparta on the other. In the case of Sparta, a mythical moment of history is exaggerated even beyond its fictive origins. In Herodotus, 7,000 men under Leonidas fought against, fought against 100,000 Persians. But it becomes a clear basis of uh, the uh, US war in Afghanistan and before that in Iraq against possible descendants of the same people defeated 2,500 years ago. Never mind that in this instance, it's actually the US Navy SEALs and the US forces more generally that are the invaders and not the Spartans. The appropriation of indigenous symbols is even more counterintuitive. After all, Geronimo led raids of Apache men against the US attempts to concentrate his nation in reservations. And after he surrendered, he was ritually humiliated by putting, being put on display in county fairs and exhibitions. I will return to this appropriation of Geronimo in the conclusion. Finally, the third genre that I want to talk about are romance novels, which I'm sure you're uh, probably very interested in. There are, you may not be surprised to know, dozens of such novels out there, most penned since the start of the War on Terror. Most are unremarkable, indeed indistinguishable from other romance novels in the arc they follow. Brooding warrior meets independent fiery woman. They clash. Independent fiery woman is slowly transformed into a damsel in distress. Brooding warrior becomes a devoted lover who rescues the damsel and all ends well. The names of some of the books um, give an indication of the erotics of their writing. One is called Drilled. Another one is called Seal Hard, Chocolate Covered Billionaire, and the Billionaire is an ex seal, or Soak, whose subtitle is, and I quote, a Navy Seal Mormon taboo romance, end quote. And others that are more about protection. So, Seal My Home, Sealed Forever, Into the Storm, and Forever Blue. 
Some of the romances include US Navy military operations, often in climactic moments, no pun intended. In Roisin Black's Someone to Come Home To, the hero, bro hero is brooding and hermit-like. He also um, has skills that um, in sev on several occasions are compared to indigenous trackers. So he is made to seem like, uh, to, to contain ancient knowledge, and I quote ancient. Um, but then the female character, the female uh, protagonist is a fiery redheaded doctor. And she ends up going to Somalia to do do-gooding humanitarianism in the Horn of Africa. And here, um, and then he comes to rescue her. Here are all the tropes that hegemonize the seals. The US as a source of humanitarian intent, whether by doctors or military men, of the darkness of Africa, and this is their language, of the goodness and the bravery of the military, and of the fecundity of the encounter between intelligent and independent women and brawny and protective men who are like tracker indigenous men. This is where I want to conclude my talk. The prevalent themes of the memoirs, managerial books, and romances are hugely relevant to the ways in which the most powerful military in the world has changed internally, and also the ways in which it is being used overseas. In their tour de force on the transformation of capitalism, Luc Boltanski and Yves Cipello traced the emergence in the 1990s of a new managerial language in business, which disavowed the Taylorist model of production, instead venerating autonomy, flexibility, decentralization, meritocracy, and management by objective as the new spirit of the age. But what was fascinating was that this new spirit of the age, which was co-opted into capitalist forms of management, was actually co-opting the tradition of the 1968 rebellions against militarized hierarchies, against bureaucracies, and against authority and petty tyranny. So the fact that these new forms of capitalism had absorbed their, their outright enemy and, and consumed it and co-opted it is, is very important here. This ex their explanation also provides a parallel to, their to the appropriation, to the SEAL's appropriation of indigenous American names, symbols, and stories as part of the war fighting cosmography of the SEALs. In my time in the shadows, I outlined the traces of the wars of conquest um, on the, in, uh, of the uh, wars of conquest in the Americas and the way that these have uh, left residues, left um, uh, traces in today's counterinsurgency practices. The lines run from, for example, from reservations, not as sovereign nations, but originally as spaces of mass detention, through to reconcentrados of Cuba and the Philippines and concentration camps of the Boer War, onto new villages of Malaya and strategic hamlets of Vietnam. I trace the various legal con concepts, including enemy combatants and extraordinary rendition, and other judicial institutions which originally were used to suppress indigenous sovereignty and to exact punishment against intransigent Aboriginal turtle islanders. But there is a way that the symbol of indigenous Turtle Island nations also function as talisman as the US fights wars of quote unquote cowboys and Indians overseas. This discourse of cowboys and Indians is so incredibly prevalent and has been so incredibly prevalent um, that during the Vietnam War, Arthur Schlesinger, uh, who was, the, uh, who was a, a biographer of JFK and, and no revolutionary lefty, actually talked about how the US military does not seem to know anything but the cowboys and Indians, quote unquote. Um, written around the uh, time of Vietnam War, exactly 50 years ago, Francis Fitzgerald wrote, to the American settlers, the defeat of the Indians had seemed not just a nationalist victory, but an achievement made in the name of humanity, the triumph of light over darkness, of good over evil, and of civilization over British nature. Quite unconsciously, the American officers and officials used a similar language to describe their war against the Vietnamese National Liberation Front. The military operations there were named after frontier monikers, Rolling Thunder, Prairie, Sam Houston, Hickory, Daniel Boone, and even Crazy Horse, which as the communist historian Richard Drinnen writes, was a, uh, the Crazy Horse was a name given to a 1966 operation carried out appropriately by elements of the 1st Cavalry Division, who traces its, um, its ancestry to the quote unquote Indian Wars. Um, there in Vietnam, the free fire zones in which the guerrillas operated were called Indian country or more pejoratively, Indian country. 
There's also something in the ways in which the Navy SEAL mythos devours indigenous American symbols that perhaps indicates a subconscious desire to consume that which has not been defeated, despite all settler colonial violence to the contrary. Or we can say that the US empire is haunted by this, one of its original sins. As Avery Gordon writes, haunting is one way in which abusive systems of power make themselves known and their impact felt in everyday life, especially when they're supposedly over and done with, such as with transatlantic slavery, for instance, or she may have said the expropriation and mass murder of indigenous Turtle Islanders, or when their oppressive nature is continuously denied, such as in the case of national security, end quote. And whether the seals star in their own memoirs or at corporate boardrooms or in cheesy romance novels, the ghost of Geronimo um, and of uh, Crazy Horse and countless others hovers in the background, a reminder that the US settler colonial violence continues unabated in the long war. Thank you very much. I hope I kept the time. Yes, uh, you did. Thank you so much, Dr. Khalili. That was everything I thought it would be. Um, you know, there's so much that you touched on um, that's coming up for me, you know, but at a real basic level, I think about the work that I see happening here in, um, like I said, in my own community, right? Where um, unlike times before, we see young folks um, in the high school and college, um, you know, you know, spaces, organizers, and activists who are asking themselves some really basic questions. Why don't we have what we need? <laughs> and through that, the, you know, really the, the, the questions and really connecting them to the contradictions of the, you know, material, or just say really the material conditions that we find ourselves in, there's a disinvestment due to the, um, you know, widespread military budget. Um, and there's a reason there's no public trans, uh, transparency in terms of the Special Operations Command because they have no budget. Um, and so I am curious to hear a bit around how you connect your, you know, your research and in your book and talks around why this matters so much at the local and connects to the local person who has a need, whether it's housing, food, um, you know, the security that it takes to feel safe, right? Um, and a government that provides. So I'm, you know, I'm really curious to hear how you connect um, this to, you know, everyday people. Shall I answer your question? Yeah. Um, so I think that this is an incredibly important question and obviously um, uh, one that uh, can be answered in a lot of ways. But I think I actually take note of some of the things that um, indigenous um, uh, Americans have said about uh, uh, the wars overseas. And that is that th these wars overseas are the continuations of wars of conquest um, inside and the constant re-legitimation of conflict in some ways precisely allows for the kinds of things that you're talking about, these outsized military budgets. Um, and the outsized military budgets are justified by uh, a, a, a constant pipeline of uh, people that have no other options. I think the impoverishments of the inner cities that, for example, you talk about, and the disinvestments that you're mentioning, and not just in the in, uh, uh, inner cities, they're also in excerpts, they're also in the countryside, and in, in, throughout the US, but also it's happening here in the UK as well. And I think that in these instances, the disinvestment actually creates, generates a, um, a sort of a push factor that pushes people into the military because Coming out of the military, you have access to um, better access to healthcare, uh, not necessarily the best of there is, but at least the veterans uh, have better access to healthcare. You have access potentially to better educational abilities and um, and scholarships, and um, and there are certain kinds of 
um, uh, processes that uh, would actually make it easier for veterans, supposedly. I mean, it's it's all supposedly to find um, kind of uh, jobs, employment, uh, a location. But we also know that, in fact, th those veterans arrive back. Often they suffer from PTSD. They um, really just don't um, have any way of uh, responding to, to the sort of devastating um, uh, kind of experiences that they've had. And, and so uh, the way in which they are rewarded is, and I, it, it, it is incredibly paltry, but for example, they're seated on airplanes first. There's no, there's no actual material reward. So in order for that pipeline to work from uh, the, 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 the kids emerging out of disinvested communities and making their way to the military and then making their way back, back and trying to find a place for themselves in inner places is through the constant justification of war. And that constant justification of war is done through making it seem like what we're fighting the good war. And we've been fighting the good war since whenever. And, and you know, the Cowboys and Indians, which is kind of embedded in the soul of every American. And, you know, and so, and so it, I think it justifies all of those. I also think it justifies one other thing. I think so much of the discourses of the Second Amendment arise out of that kind of com complete and total internalization of Cowboys and Indians. That is, it is the, the, the sort of mythology that you need the gun because you're in the, at the frontier. Um, and that also is incorporated in, into the ways in which people are thinking about it. And so I think all, all of those, for all of those things, the experience of indigenous Americans and the way that it's parlayed into subsequent wars in the long war overseas um, end up being really important. So many of those indigenous Americans said, there's a, there's a particular quote from John Fire Lame Deer, who was a Lakota elder, um, and he says that he looked, took a picture um, of uh, he saw he looked at, he looked at pictures of uh, My Lai massacre in Vietnam, and to him those images were exactly like images he'd seen at Wounded Knee. And he said the only difference is that Vietnam is hot, and Wounded Knee was cold. The weather was cold. And and to me that kind of a parallel. Um, the, the imperial war overseas and the constant war of conquest inside is is foundational to the US. Absolutely. I thank you for that. I, I'm thinking about, you know, in your talk where you mentioned um, the roles um, that these uh, special operators uh, uh, went on to, you know, to, to do, whether it's to find a way through contracts um, or, you know, further shaping minds um, through that, you know, uh, particular um, mindset. It brought up for me how much, uh, you know, only that did I see this at um, Special Operations Command that if a colonel or general retired on a Friday, um, they took a little bit of leave to, you know, uh, unpack, and they were within a month back in a polo shirt with, you know, one of the named defense uh, industries. And um, although they were retired, were still referred to um, by that yeah. military. Exactly. Yeah. And that um, quickly became where offices that had people in uniforms were replaced in real time in real estate um, by these defense, um, you know, corporations. Um, um, and so, you know, there's so much work that's happening both here locally, the young folks who are, you know, connecting the contradictions of militarization through the police department um, and how they, you know, have a real militarized presence in, you know, on the blocks and in communities when resources are needed but also on a national level around dismantling the military industrial complex as it's an elephant that again is a part of this propaganda and narrative that is romanticized that you speak um, about. And so I'm curious, you know, how, how do you, you know, if you were to share some words to the folks that are really doing that work at the community to the national um, around a regenerative economy um, to, to, to fuel those social needs. Um, like you said, and you were also experiencing this in London. I'm curious if you can share a little bit uh, uh, some thoughts around that as well. So I think that um, 
actually the, the person who I look to when I try to think about in what ways can communities fight against these forms of militarization, but also of policing, um, uh, as I look to Maryam Kaba, who lives in Washington, D.C., but who got her um, chops, I think, in working in Chicago. And Maryam Kaba's, um, uh, I'm sorry, who lives in New York right now, not Washington, D.C., but who did her work in um, Chicago. And Maryam Kaba is constantly talking about about how we have to really focus on um, community organizing and constant mutual care for one another and an abolitionist politics that forces us to actually look to our communities for support, um, for resolution of conflict, for restorative forms of justice, um, reparative forms of justice. And I think that um, th those kinds of community um, supports um, are really necessary also for people that are coming out of the military, because as you mentioned, one of the things that happens, and as I've written about this, um, a lot of the people that come out of the military find that, find going into the carceral system, into the policing system, the easiest route to go, the only employments that they can find, right? They either go and become prison wardens or they end up joining the police force. And I think that, in fact, what this means is that they're moving from one system of violence to another system of violence. And the, and the second system of violence acts, enacts its violence upon the bodies of fellow citizens and, and fellow residents. And I think that it's, this is, this is quite horrific. Um, I mean, I don't have to tell you guys, you guys are in Chicago, you know, about the warehouses where uh, Chicago police officers were kidnapping people and were taking them and torturing them in the way that they used to. And many of these policemen were, and women were uh, former veterans. And so I think that that would be actually one of the ways in which communities can function is, is to sort of em embrace the veterans in a way, provides them with help and support in a way that doesn't mean that that pipeline of kids from disinvested areas going into the military then immediately come out and join the carceral system to suppress their former neighbors. And so I think that that, again, borrowing from Mariam Kaba, those forms of community organizing are perhaps the most important. I also do think that there has to be a way of countering this kind of a constant buzz of memoirs, romance novels, uh, whatever that is in the background, because I think that these self-help books, self-help books are one of the biggest categories of uh, books that sell in the US. And so I think that in a way, um, uh, it, it is quite a, um, it, it is important to counter these uh, narratives. And I think that in part, part and, and this is an answer to one of the questions that was asked was, what is the purpose of these three books? Part of the reason that I am doing this analysis is because I'm trying to find out where is it that this mythology that the US is doing good both by its soldiers and by the people overseas, where does this mythology come from? And so that's part of the reason why I looked at these three books. That's really helpful. Um, something you just said, you know, just really drew um, on something that I was curious about that I, I noticed in your one of your previous um, pieces is really around um, what's happening in academia um, as one example, uh, and I should say academia around this that you're, you know, writing and speaking and researching um, to find answers and really action um you know i know you know harvard had a piece um around you know really normalizing counterinsurgency as a good yeah. um and you know of course the connection between you know military special operations and police i remember you know after the 2020 righteous you know uprising um, they were called into, you know, the community to be held accountable for their, um, you know, discussion around how police should model their responses in community um, to the military. And so it, it really does show in a way, um, dare I say, in, you know, neoliberal um, spaces and in our politics. Um, and, and it's because we draw from places with, you know, uh, rapport. Uh, such as Harvard. And so I'm curious, um, is there work that's happening in, you know, that 
you know, from a academic perspective, you know, in terms of, yeah, I'm curious to know like what the community work looks like in academia to have more accountability, more of a balanced conversation. I know we talk about in the community, how we draw on experiences and can share that, um, but oftentimes in communities, um, or I should say on campuses, it's often um, something that goes without oversight. So one of the one of the things that I think is really interesting to talk about is you were earlier mentioning the generals who leave and then come back in a, in a month with a polo shirt on, and and then and I want to connect that to academia. Uh, the perfect example of that is um, General Stanley McChrystal, uh, who was the head of JSOC. Um, he wasn't a Navy SEAL. He was not a U.S. Navy SEAL. Admiral McRaven was, and Admiral McRaven is now the Chancellor of University of Texas. Um, General McChrystal uh, ended up, uh, once he left uh, the military because he had bad mouth Obama and Biden, um, he, ended up, uh, he, he ended up actually uh, setting up his own consulting firm, McChrystal Consulting, and, uh, and also at the same time started teaching a course, um, leadership course, um, at Yale, which he has been doing since 2013. So, so there's Yale, there's his consulting business, and then when when COVID happened, his consulting firm uh, decided to get into provision of um, consulting support to local, uh, to, to sort of local municipalities and, and state governments um, to, 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 to sort of provide COVID um, uh, studies and help. And, and one wonders, Genuinely, how does somebody who was in charge of killing people move into a consulting business and, and tries to take advantage of trillions of dollars in healthcare budgets by setting up these kinds of these kinds of um, these kinds of businesses? And of course, he also has the cred because he teaches once you know a year at Yale, so he's got the imprimatur of Yale on him. Harvard has, is um, I regularly joke about the fact that the Kennedy School at Harvard is like the retirement home for former war criminals. They come from all over the place. Um, uh, they and 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 to me, um, their question of accountability is a really interesting one because the extent to which I in the UK can hold Harvard accountable is minimal. However, interestingly, the same Kennedy School was going to have the um, governor of Michigan, who had been in charge of the travesty um, at uh, at uh, the, the water um, uh, travesty in Michigan, they were going to make him a fellow of Kennedy School. And there was so much student and faculty complaint about this, that uh, around the, the fact that this guy was culpable for Flint, Michigan, and for children in an African-American community in this, this in city that has been massively disinvested from and has been completely ripped to shreds. Um, this guy was going to become a Kennedy fellow and the students protested and got him uh, removed. But, you know, that was one minor small thing. And, and the fact is that the academy has been so complicit, so consistently since whenever from the start, um, you know, uh, as early as to, uh, 1919, an academic who's the grandfather of a current US congressman and the father of William Colby of CIA, wrote a, an article in a magazine calling how to fight savage tribes, quote unquote. And he's talking about the final suppression of indigenous Americans. The academy has been completely in the US embedded in University of Michigan trained the cops that were going to go and you know sort of police uh, places in Vietnam. Uh, and, and so th there's this incredible embeddedness of the academy in imperial ventures. One hopes that your collective and the fellowships that you guys are doing that actually tries to counter some of this could be a, a form of pushback against them. But really the only way would be to have that kind of community organizing by students and staff against those forms of depredations. Thank you, that, that, that's helpful. Um, and for you know, so many of the you know, young folks who continue to do um, this work who are also joining us today, 
I really hope that they, um, you know, heard you. You know, I spoke a little bit about, um, you know, some of what I, you know, saw in, you know, quite honestly, I'll, you know, say the proliferation of, of soft that you mentioned. Um, you know, I share this as one of the, you know, radicalizing points. Um, what shook me into consciousness while I'm on active duty was um, to see, you know, previous, you know, regulations um, and rules that we had, you know, in, in the past go completely away um, in, in, in those, you know, special ops, um, in the special ops arena. And, you know, even when we look at, you mentioned Africa, when we look at the AFRICOM command, um, what we see happening in Haiti, um, if you look at the map of where special operations um, are today, um, it is because they want you to know they're there or they're okay with that. I'm also um, informed by, um, there's so many places that we just um, don't have um, an insight to. Yeah. Um, and being in a unit, that um, wrote the media releases that we heard on the evening news and knowing in real time that that wasn't the reality of what was actually happening. Um, I'm curious if you can talk a bit, and I, know, and, I, and I know we talked about this, but I think that there's something that really um, feels you know, important to highlight in this moment for a myriad of reasons. We're looking towards you know, more um, increased um, conflicts, um, you know, in real time. And I think it's, you know, it, it just feels like a really right moment to talk a bit about um, how much of a, you know, global presence, um, how much of a, um, you know, this proliferation uh, happening in real time. So it's about normalizing it, but also I'm curious to hear your thoughts around perhaps the, the dangers and the, the contradictions that don't keep us safe yeah. in the way they operate. So I think that your point about AFRICOM is really, really important. And I think that it's because the US sees itself in competition with China and China's making sort of infrastructural and um, extractive inroads into Africa. I think that the US presence in AFRICOM, uh, uh, sorry, the AFRICOM's presence in Africa actually echoes that in some ways it is trying to sort of challenge um, uh, challenge China. But I also think that it is part of the sort of expanding footprint of the United States everywhere in the world. There was some uh, a statistic that something like 90% uh, of the countries of the world have a presence by US special operations forces, um, which is quite an astonishing percentage. Now, what is interesting about this is that this obviously, this is supposed to keep us safe, but I think I think it does actually, the functions of the US Special Operation Forces are multiple. One, as you said, it is to sort of say, hey, we're here. You know, the maps in some ways indicate that the US is in all of these places. That's number one. Number two, I think that in some ways, um, having this kind of presence in all sorts of places also justifies uh, all of the US military presence at home. Uh, which I think is also quite fascinating because in, uh, in the, the, the presence of massive U US military bases is often sold to communities as this being a great you know, thing for the economy, this being a great thing for uh, employment. And of course, what it is, is it's great for militarization. Um, and we know this because because we see the way that these bases actually end up sucking the economic juice out of the rest of the area. We know that um, domestic violence and gendered violence is the highest around these bases. We know that we know a lot about these things. And I think that this sort of uh, inability to shut down uh, any any kind of military presence in the United States is tied very closely to the constant expansion overseas, and those two are connected. And of course, you know when when you are going to uh, the famous saying is when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So situations that could be diplomatically resolved or addressed with special operations forces, which could potential which has potential for you know expansion of violence elsewhere. 
That's right. There's a, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you a very, you know, uh, simple yet dear question to my fellow uh, NEH fellows. Um, what would you say, uh, what role does an artist, um, you know, we're in a graduate class or in a class with graduate students um, who, you know, through this, you know, work talking about the, the, the long wars, um, you know, the question that was asked is, you know, what role does the artist in artwork, um, you know, how do they participate? Um, and, 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 and what you're sharing with us um, as, you know, important in this work? Um, I am a firm believer that artistic production, whether with words or images or sounds, um, is enormously important in trying to change the larger narrative. And I think, as I mentioned, there are these particular narratives that legitimize the sort of US imperial expansion overseas. And I think that the role of um, art is to make us question these things. It is on the one hand to, uh, to offer a kind of a, um, a kind of an, alternative way of looking at the world. Uh, I don't I don't want to be prescriptive about art because obviously the best art is the kind of art that you know that emerges in, in this kind of uh, organic way. Um, but I do think that what makes me think is the things that is is the kind of artwork that questions the norm, that asks us to challenge those normalized forms of violence that um that that shows experiences that are difficult to put in words which i think ex the experiences particularly of veterans often tends to be like that and so i think those are really the kinds of um uh the, the, the kinds of functions for art that i do see thank you so much dollar Khalil. it was so good to be in conversation with you um, that concludes my questions. And Ranak, I want to uh, invite you on to continue. Do you have any questions you'd like to ask? Well, thank you, Natasha. And what a great segue to sort of come back in and the discussion of art there at the end. But let me first thank both of you for really a special conversation. You know, it really speaks to the heart of this project, which is we're trying to bring different kinds of constituencies into conversation about these questions. And Professor Khalili, you've hit on so many of the important nodes of our overarching project in your in your formal remarks and also in this discussion. And it reminds me that you really are one of our, you, without knowing it, have been a key interlocutor for a lot of us over the last year and a half as we've been organizing this project. And so I just want to name that because there are so many different kinds of folks in the room. There are there are Navy SEAL, former Navy SEALs and former Marines. There are artist fellows. There are anti-war activists and war resistors. There are students from all of also all sorts of disparate parts of UIC who are joining us. And I just want to name Professor Khalili that part of what we're trying to do in this work is centering communities and groups that are often that fall outside of the dominant narratives in which we think about these long wars, right? And that's partly why putting the echoes and residues of the US American Indian Wars, as we put it in quotes, in conversation with the global war on terror was really important to us. Putting in connection the domestic and global dimensions of US warfare today was really important to us. And you really modeled that for us. We also want to center, especially in, in the veteran art triennial that's going to open in March in Chicago, this the foreground Black, Indigenous, Puerto Rican veterans of these GWAT experiences, right? And, you know, of course, we have Natasha here, but, it, you know, the reason we wanted to do that was to say that a lot of Black and Indigenous and other people of color who experience this complex disidentificatory relationship to being part of the U.S. war machine, but then coming from communities that, as you've already talked about, are devastated by the impacts of the carceral state and the warfare state. And then we wanted to add one extra le level, which is to say, what if we put in conversation the descendants of native and indigenous peoples who've experienced US settler colonialism on Turtle Island with artists drawn from South and Swana, you know, South Asia and Swana and the greater Middle East, who are you know, experiencing the devastating ongoing impacts of the war on terror, put those communities in conversation in ways that rarely happen. So I guess this is a long windup to 
ask you to reflect and, and tell us how we can better model the logic of comparison and relationality, which is so beautifully woven through a lot of your work and especially in Time in the Shadows. I mean, you're pulling together all of these different archives of European and American statecraft and counterinsurgency in your work. And we're trying to bring some of that spirit to the work we're doing here from the vantage point, not from the state, but from the subaltern, right? From the perspective of people who, who are most impacted by these war regimes. So talk to us a little bit about comparison, intimacy, the kind of stranger relations that you map in your work and how we can model that in, in the art and the conversations that we're having today. You must have a way directly into my brain because um, one of the sentences that I cut from uh, the paper in order to fill it in 30 minutes um, was a sentence that said, in his re opening in uh, introduction to relaunching of comparative studies of South Asia, um, Africa, and the Middle East, RF Derlich says, what if we don't compare? What if we connect? And I think that that logic of connection to me seems um, not only uh, much more uh, productive um, intellectually, because it does allow for us to see connections, but it also feels much more intimate and less power laden, because comparison sounds like somebody is standing on the outside comparing these two, two things, whereas connection sounds like you're standing on the inside of this. With all of our complexities and resistances, with all of our involvements and engagements, and we are connected to each other. And I think that that recognition of the connections, um, and I think particularly the recognition of the connection of the subaltern, of those who don't have, um, they're not at the core of power, uh, is enormously important, particularly at this moment where white nationalists and other kinds of nationalist um, sort of uh, sentiments are traveling across the borders. We need to have subaltern um, forms of resistances also traveling across the borders. That's the only thing that's going to save us. That's beautiful. And you rightly pointed out, you know, when you earlier were tracking Harvard's and, you know, the way stations, retirement homes for war criminals that elites, right, are always making those kinds of connections. That's there are the same groups of people at US Mexico border, in, in, Pal in Palestine, all over the world, right, that are yeah. doing kind of elite security infrastructural work. And so how do we build our movements to make those kinds of connections? That's precisely what our, we're hoping our, our small project will kind of contribute to that spirit. Natasha, I'm not sure if there's if there's something pressing for you, but I, I want to ask, I guess, one more question, just given the you know nature of who's in the room, that we're trying to trace in this project the long history of war resistors and anti-war activism amongst veterans. And so, you know, we had Roxanne Dunmar Ortiz start our series, and then Kyle Mays, um, professor at UCLA, talking, who works in Black Studies and Native Studies, talking about the problematics of solidarity, the complexity of actually building solidarity amongst Indigenous and Black communities. But I'm wondering if you could reflect a little bit about how, even in our cultural criticism of, you know, all of these different genres that have proliferated uh, of, of statecraft and warcraft in the in GWAT wars onwards, that we may be missing um, some of the perspective of us and a the sliver of anti-war activism that exists in this in this community of, of veterans, contemporary veterans, and how foregrounding their practices at the local, national, and global level might actually transform some of our criticism, might tr transform some of our analysis of the contradictions of you know late late modern war, if you will. So I have to say, um, when I wrote the war, uh, time in the shadows, um, I wouldn't have been able to write it. Uh, at all without being led to what I was doing by some of the veterans who had become anti-war activists. Um, people that had been interrogators and who had published Mia Culpas and who, um, uh, who, who, who opened themselves to interviewing me um, or the uh, Judge Advocate General JAG lawyers of various detainees who at the expense of ever being able to get a promotion within the military had chosen to stand for um, 
the right thing to do. And so without those um, folks who had become explicitly anti-war and who had explicitly chosen a set of a kind of an oppositional politics, often at great cost to themselves, uh, I wouldn't have been able to write what I did. So I think that uh, highlighting those folks is particularly important and providing a space for them to speak about it. it it's, it's interesting because in, after the Vietnam War, despite all of the mythology about veterans getting spat at, etc., a huge amount of really quite radical music and artwork and uh, emerged that was that was produced by subaltern actors that was amazing and 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 it was popular, you know, it was part of the pop culture. Um, and I think that um, I haven't seen the same extent that partially because it would the exception of like programs such as yours um and i think that part part of that is because much the same way that we have learned about oppositional politics and much the same way that many of our amazing anti-war veterans have learned from their progenitors from the vietnam war because there was obviously a huge contingent of anti-war veterans then as well uh, the war makers have also learned from before, and they have a machinery in place that produces bullshit like the kinds of pro-war crap that comes out on television and screen, you know? And so, so we, we, I think it's a constant battle. So we need our anti-imperialist romance novels. Like, that's the takeaway. Yes, of it, right? totally. Lots yeah. of sexy and radical and transformative and anti- Really. You know, Funding the carceral state and the warfare state. I just want to lift up the work of Aaron Hughes, our collaborator here, who's you know foundational to the emerging veteran art movement, and it's doing that work, you know, and thinking about the long history through the latter half of the 20th century, that that Vietnam War era moment onwards, about building movement culture, but also foregrounding the space of art and 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 you know sort of radical art and culture as being central to the documentation and archival work we're doing in this moment even as a lot of folks have um, moved on um, from thinking about war economies written yeah. Natasha, any, any, any thoughts that are coming to mind to you as we close out here? We have a couple minutes left and you know, I wanna invite folks, I know we've answered. Can I, can I actually, there is a question and in, in the, uh, the couple of questions in the um, uh, Q&A box that I'd like to actually respond to if that's all right. So uh, one of the um, attendees who's, anon who's anonymous says, what is the purpose of the three types of books and how are they using Native American symbols? So I talked about some of that in the talk, but the, the reason that these three books, um, uh, these three genres um, are, are quite interesting to me is because one of them is memoirs. Everybody is write, writing memoirs. And I think that that's, so it's important for that reason. Um, the second, uh, as I mentioned, the self-help books are really interesting because self-help books are one of the sort of highest selling genres. And it's really interesting that the Navy SEALs go into that. And romances are interesting because, of course, everybody reads them, right? Uh, even though you don't admit it, romances are sexy. People read them. Um, so um, the, re the way that they use the Native American symbols differs. So the memoirs are inevitably going to have all sorts of sort of references to Native American symbols. The, the very first thing is that um, all the Navy SEALs carry a hatchet. So okay, they carry a tomahawk. And so that even that sort of a basic thing is, ends up being quite significant to that. And then they, of course, write about the Geronimo. We, we wouldn't have known, for example, about the Geronimo thing um, if uh, some of these guys hadn't written their memoirs. So, so that's how those guys do it. The question of um, the self-help books is the way that it uses uh, tribal uh, ideas of tribe and frontier um, as, as a center. And the narratives that are used in uh, romance novels actually um, tend, to, tend to have, you know, they drop in symbols when they need to, but also importantly, that element of, uh, I, the reason I mentioned The Last of the Mohicans is because that element of a romance novel is also central to The Last of the Mohicans. It's a, it's a genre of American writing, which as others have written about, um, it, it actually reproduces not only 
romance, fecundity of the nation and all of that, that also reproduces a narrative of conquest of the land, right? The way that things stand in for each other. So that's part of the reason that I was using those three books. Um, also, uh, Jean Smiling uh, Coyote has said that, uh, has asked the question about how uh, the Navajo ceremony uh, they've read about, which is to help the returning warriors reintegrate back into civilian life. And Monty Little has, uh, rep has rep uh, replied that veterans come back from war or after their service, they go through the enemy way ceremony and then blessing way afterwards for cleansing. And I think that these forms of um, uh, indigenous community um, ceremonies and rituals could be uh, could be a way of reincorporating people back into the community in ways that allows for the forms of mutual aid and community building that I mentioned earlier, which are, I think, very crucial for supporting people, but also preventing them from joining the carceral state. Um, uh, I think that these kinds of cleansing ceremonies are incredibly important. Rituals make us, we, whether or not we believe it. And I think that it's really important to have these kinds of rituals. And then finally, um, do you think the continuum of indigenous symbols in the military are continuous with sports mascots? Absolutely. Um, because sports in the US is actually very closely tied to the military. I mean, we, you know, particularly football, um, but also other sports. And I think that militarization of football and the way that it has become this kind of a symbol, which uh, is the reason why um, the, the uh, please forgive me, I'm, uh, it's 11 o'clock and my brain is failing, but the very good looking uh, former San Francisco. Uh, yes. Thank you. Sorry. His uh, kneeling um, was seen as an affront is because football has been incorporated into this kind of a jingoistic uh, element. And it was everybody would immediately say, well, he's disrespecting the flag and therefore he's disrespecting the troops. And so in, 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 in a way, that intimateness and the intimacy between sports and the military um, is about forms of masculinity. It's about forms of uh, nationhoodness or nationness. And so the devouring of indigenous symbols into these extremely natural nationalist symbols is definitely something about, I don't know, I'm not Freudian, but if I were to do a Freudian interpretation, I would say that it is on the one hand appropriating the other, but it's also devouring them so that they could, because you recognize that despite everything, they have not yet been defeated. Brilliant. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Professor Khalili. We're a minute before the end of our time. We want to respect your time. I know it's late in London. Thank you for bringing all of this fire and knowledge to our group. We're going to really very much appreciate it. There will be a recording of this today's discussion. Um, thank you, Natasha Erskine, so much for your work and for the organizing and all of the questioning. Thank you to the grad seminar class that stuck with us. And thank you all very much for joining us today. Please stay tuned for more events come spring 2023 semester with Harsha Walia um, starting in January. Thank you so can, much. Can I, before we go, can I first thank Natasha? It's an honor to speak with you. And um, you are, you're, you're such an, I can't wait to see what kind of artwork you produce. Um, so I would, I would love to uh, see more of your work and, and, the, and, and the work of your other colleagues in the program. Ronak, um, Aaron and Aaron, thank you so much for inviting me and for asking me to be here. It is, it's been extraordinary and, and a complete and utter pleasure. And, uh, and yeah, it is 11 o'clock here but this was completely worth it so and my daughter didn't come in and burst in and make noise so yay small thank victories that's all around thank you so yes. much for spending all this time with us very much appreciate my pleasure thank you very much thank you everyone be well bye-bye bye-bye